there is, uh, I had to come face to face with my own ignorance. I had to uh, have conversations with so many friends over the years where we had to face our own ignorance about the fact that there are more than 2000 scriptures on the subject of money uh, in, the, in, you know, in the Old Testament as well as the New, but we just barely knew a few of them. And even the ones that we knew were ones about warnings. We didn't know uh, what, what the rest of the scriptures were about. And it also dawned on us that Jesus himself in a lot of the parables, one third of his parables were on the subject of money and financial stewardship. And we share a quote here by Tony Campolo. There are 2000 plus verses of scripture that tell us that we must be committed to protecting the poor and the oppressed. There is no concern of scripture that is addressed so often and so powerfully as reaching out to the poor. So here's something interesting, right? There are 2000 plus scriptures on the subject of money and finances and financial stewardship. And there are 2000 verses also uh, on the subject of protecting the poor and the oppressed. I love another quote by Tony Campolo here. He's never said, Jesus never says to the poor, come find the church. Jesus never says to the poor, come find the church. But he says of to those of us in the church, go into the world and find the poor, hungry, homeless, and imprisoned. All right. So this brings me to the other point right now. And you may be wondering, why am I talking about this? Please bear with me. I'm going somewhere with this. How do churches spend their money? So again, church is made of people. So you and I are the church as well, but I'm talking about entire church communities as well, right? Uh, how do church churches across denominations, I'm not singling, singling out or pointing at any denomination here, I'm speaking to the global church. How do global the global body of believers, churches across denominations spend their money? Now, based on the 2014 survey, this is more than 10 years ago, right? Based on the 2014 survey of over 1,600 churches, this is what it showed, right? Based on the survey that was done. 48% is on salaries and wages. 22% is on the church building, maintenance, insurance, utilities. 12% is on ministries and support. 9% on missions. 4% on admin. 3% uh, on is, is under other and two person reserves and so on. Um, this tells a story that even for churches, even for organized churches, denominations, entire denominations, entire churches that have got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of members, they are limited in their budget because what's happening is if you do the math here, 48 plus 22 plus, um, you know, uh, maybe 4% or whatever, you are having almost 70, more than 70, 70 to 75%, at times 80% of the church budget that's either going towards salaries of church staff or uh, is going, and it's going towards the maintenance of the building and so on, uh, purchase of land and the church building and the maintenance and upkeep of the church building. So the actual percentage or actual amount that, that uh, can go and should go towards things like hospitals and uh, healthcare and um, the poor, educating poor children, orphans, widows, and so on, that is significantly lesser than what it could and should be in the light of these 2000 plus verses that we read about and we know about. And, 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 uh, and, and we, are, we just made reference to a few seconds earlier. And so I come back to this very, very interesting quote uh, by a man uh, who's very, very respected and he's already passed away as an author and poet. And he made this statement and I like this statement. Uh, he says this, it is very difficult. It is very difficult to get a man to understand something when his job depends on not understanding it. It is difficult to get a man to understand something when his job depends on not understanding it. What's the problem? The problem is that even decisions in terms of how church uh, finances are, are spent, how money is spent, how tithes and offerings that are collected are spent. Unfortunately, those decisions are made by a small handful of people. Sometimes in some cases, it's just made by one or two people. And so if the salary of an individual uh, uh, 
is affected by their decision, then you know it it's it's going to be very tricky because what happens then is if uh, if a pastor uh, is insecure or if a church leader or entire church board is insecure about their future, about their position or about their salary, uh, then what happens is it will also end up hijacking the preaching and teaching that comes uh, out of that church or from that ministry. Let me let me give you an example. The million dollar question. If there are 2000 plus verses about the poor in scripture, um, why isn't there much preaching and teaching about giving to the poor? Let me answer that. Because many pastors and leaders are concerned that if they start speaking about giving to the poor, then chances are their tithes, they are insecure, especially those pastors and leaders who are heavily dependent on tithes and offerings. They're concerned that their tithes and offerings may come down. In fact, I've been in a church where the pastors from the, the pastor, senior pastor from the stage would say, hey, don't give your tithes and offerings to the poor. Make sure that you're giving your tithes faithfully, faithfully and not giving, not using that to give to the poor. All right. So I have actually heard that as well. Where is that coming from? It's coming from a place of insecurity and fear, right? So what's happening there? You're having churches, you're having church leaders who have been consumed with fear and insecurity who are not able to even talk about the things that the scriptures um, uh, um, um, focus on and, and highlight. For example, the 2000 plus scriptures on protecting the, the poor and, and the widow and the orphan. Now, there are also 2000 plus scriptures on the subject of money. Now, again, why will pastors and, and, and ministers not talk about that? Because they are also afraid that if they go after that subject, if they talk about that subject, they'll be accused of bringing prosperity preachers. So many pastors and so on are, are afraid and insecure. They don't want to upset people. They don't want to be accused of being uh, prosperity preachers. And so they don't want to talk about that. They don't want to upset people. They don't want to anger people. They are afraid that the people will leave. And so they want to stay safe and not say things or not teach on subjects that can offend people and that can affect their tithes and offerings to drop uh, because when people leave tithes and offerings drop no brainer there and so what happens is whether it's knowingly or unknowingly uh, pastors uh, and their decision making in, in terms of how they allocate church budgets to how they um, what subjects they choose to preach and teach on is influenced by okay uh, self preservation how can i how can i uh, what can i preach and how can i preach and teach in a way that doesn't upset people how can i preach and teach in a way that uh, that makes sure that the tithes and offerings don't get affected how can i teach and preach in a way where you know uh, i can continue to maintain the building and keep the building because the building costs money and their salaries to be paid and so here's my point again. I think COVID was a huge shock because COVID not just jolted businesses globally. I think the COVID, I think the whole COVID crisis shocked uh, the church and church leaders globally, right? And so the the here's the thing, and the million dollar question that you need to ask yourself is, who are you following? Are you following the shepherd, or are you following the herd? Because as I mentioned in previous calls, even my in my Christian life, I've made the mistake many times. Because I was so hungry for fatherly affection and fatherly affirmation and a fatherly embrace, somewhere along my Christian life, though I came to Christ from a Hindu background, somewhere along my own walk, my own Christian life, I traded God the Father for a man. I traded God the Father for a pastor. I traded God the Father for a prophet and a minister. I traded God the Father for a father figure. Um, and and I, I, would, I was doing things, uh, believing things, and performing for fatherly affirmation. Uh, for me to hear the pastor say, good job, well done, was more important than for me to hear Jesus say, well done. And that's a very dangerous place to be. I, I want to tell you, uh, uh, 10 out of 10 people, 100% of people uh, eventually die, right? And so we all have our day in court. We'll all have to stand before God one day, and we all have to give an account, an answer. 
for how we lived our lives and the decisions we made. And when we stand before him, we cannot point to this pastor, that prophet or this minister and say, oh, I'm sorry, Lord, I could not uh, you know, obey you or I, I could not do this, that and the other. Uh, I could not uh, heed your voice. Uh, I could not respond to you, Holy Spirit, because I had to please X, Y, Z or I had to please the man or the minister or the pastor. That excuse is not going to work. Right. In fact, the most scariest verse um, in 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 Luke chapter six, verse forty six, where Jesus is telling, and and he and he's being very blunt there. He's saying, "Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things that I'm telling you?" In Matthew chapter seven, he says something else, like equally equally provocative and, and confrontational. He says, "Not everybody who calls me Lord." He's, this is Jesus speaking. He's saying, not everybody who calls me Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everyone who calls me Lord will enter the kingdom. Right? And, and he goes on to say something else. He says, on many will, will say to me on that day, that Lord, did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not prophesy in your name? And I will tell them, depart from me. I never knew you. So that's, again, something to think about. Very sobering thought. It's not our, de our, our a declaration of lordship that determines whether we will make it. Um, it's something to think about, right? 